For many Europeans, the south begins in Slovenia. Behind the last high mountains of the Alps, you can find the first glimpses of the Balkan Peninsula across the rugged, hilly landscape. And in the Mediterranean coastal towns, you can dream of faraway places while sitting on the shore. For a long time, the history of this country was closely linked to the Habsburgs. For centuries, here in Nupitsa, they bred the white horses used by the Spanish riding school in Vienna. Here, they fended off enemies and recruited soldiers for their wars. Here, to provide a modern link between the imperial city and the Mediterranean coast, they built large sections of the Southern Railway. And here, they opened one of the most modern and beautiful hotels of its time in the thermal spa health resorts on the northern Adriatic Sea. They had a great interest in coming to the sea, and this interest has actually stayed through the centuries. It is important to note that the motto of the Slovenian national movement was all for faith, fatherland and Kaiser. Today, Austria and Slovenia are linked in partnership as democratic states and they are trying through their initiative, the Austria-Slovenian Neighbour Dialogue, among other things, to get to know their common heritage through events and other activities. Und für die Zukunft zu nutzen. Large parts of Slovenia were under Habsburg rule for centuries. Despite this long shared history, the state, founded in 1988, bears hardly any reminders of its former Austrian rule. Memorabilia from the imperial era are now mostly found in museums, such as the stone head of Kaiser Franz Joseph from the Ljubljana City Museum, which used to be part of the monument in the Slovenian capital. Nostalgia for the imperial time is mostly just hinted at in Slovenia, for example in some of the former seats of power, like Stadenberg Palace. The Habsburgs' relationship to Slovenia was definitely closer than this, especially as it was often depicted during the Second World War, not least with the Austrian ruling family appreciating the strategic location of the country. The easily passable crossings into Italy and the Adriatic are of great importance in today's Slovenian territory and have been used since ancient times. The Habsburgs were drawn primarily to the Adriatic by the port city of Trieste, rather than the cities of Copa and Peran, which were strongly influenced by the Venetians, and which attract many tourists to the Slovenian coast today. The Habsburgs already had a great interest in the southeastern border of the empire. They had a great interest in coming to the sea. This interest has actually remained over the centuries. Although when Trieste submitted to the Habsburgs, it is not entirely clear for the following few centuries whether the Habsburgs were aware of Trieste's location or what opportunities it had. The Habsburgs only became aware of this with the increasing weakness of the Republic of Venice. And it was at the end of the 16th century that Trieste became practically important for the Habsburgs' focus. Although Tito's partisans liberated Trieste at the end of the Second World War, and a census before the First World War in 1910 found that there were more Slovenians living in Trieste than in Ljubljana, Italy was ultimately awarded the port city. Trieste was the goal destination of the southern train line, which aimed to link the imperial city of Vienna with the Adriatic. The building works began in the 1840s, when the route was led over Celia and Ljubljana. It was first continuously accessible from 1857, with the completion of the section between Ljubljana and Trieste. 
Franz Joseph and Elizabeth personally opened the last section on May the 11th, 1857. On the opening journey, the train stopped in Postoina, where one of the country's best sites, the Postoina Cave, is located. The history of the second biggest stalactite cave in the world is closely connected with the Austrian imperial house. The cave received its first royal visit in 1815 from Franz I. When the cave was being prepared for a second visit three years later by the Austrian Kaisers, Luca Czech discovered its inner chambers as well as a 21-kilometer-long tunnel system. This was the start of the tourist developments in the cave. It was Kaiser Ferdinand II who was the first visitor to sign the cave's Golden Guest Book in 1819. Kaiser Franz Joseph was so impressed by the cave that he visited it for a second time in 1883 on the 600th anniversary of the incorporation of the Carniola region into the Habsburg monarchy. At that time, the cave already had a railway system and was the first cave in the world to be electrified. By holding regular balls in the cave and with the opening of the first underground post office, which ran daily from 1911, Postoina was able to create further features which contributed to its early touristic success. In the Postoina cave, the history of the Habsburgs is more present than in almost any other place in Slovenia. The Habsburgs were quite popular in Slovenia. The brother of Kaiser Franz I, Archduke Johann, was particularly loved. Like in Germany to the north and Styria in Slovenia to the south, he carried out significant modernization projects in agriculture and infrastructure. The connection between Slovenia and the Habsburgs can also be seen from the fact that even the nationalist circles were not interested initially in breaking away from the monarchy, but rather in establishing a Slovenian-speaking crown land based on the Hungarian model. It is important to note that the motto of the Slovenian national movement, especially the conservative part, was actually all for faith, fatherland, and Kaiser. In principle, it should be noted that the Slovenians were very loyal to the Habsburgs. Catholic, of course, and they also had a Slovenian anthem for Kaiser Franz Joseph, who ultimately ruled for a very long time. There were also celebrations there for government anniversaries, so it was all particularly celebrated. In honor of the 40th anniversary of the Kaiser's reign, in Ljubljana, the Dragon Bridge was built over the years of 1900 to 1901. It was the first reinforced concrete structure built in Ljubljana and is one of the first and largest jubilee bridges of its kind in Europe. The Slovenians placed great hope in the reform wishes of Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austrian throne. Franz Ferdinand naturally included the political elites of all nationalities living in Austria-Hungary in his considerations for the major reform of Austria-Hungary. To do this, he was also in a lively exchange with Slovenia, and some of his close associates were important figures in the Slovenian political and cultural movement. Even after the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, the political leaders of the Yugoslavian club in parliament tried to create independence from the Slovenian territories under the Habsburg crown. But at some point, enough was enough. The imperial manifesto from Charles I simply came too late, which means they were very loyal for a long time. They waited. So supposedly it was said to the Kaiser at the audience, Your Majesty, it is too late. 
This was just a few months before the monarchy actually collapsed and the First World War ended. Slovenia not only had a close relationship with Kaiser Franz Joseph, but also with his brother, Archduke Ferdinand Maximilian, later Maximilian of Mexico. The fate of many Slovenians who voluntarily followed the Habsburg on his ultimately fatal adventure across the Atlantic has almost been forgotten. A few years ago, the illustrator Sorian Smiljanic and the author Marian Pushavitz brought back this story and gave new life to this Mexican story in a multi-volume comic. It has also now been published in German. We made the comic about Maximilian and the Slovenian sailors mainly because we both like westerns, and in western films, Mexico has always played a very important role. We know that all the losers and bandits in western films retreated to the so-called liberated area in Mexico. Also, the losers who lost their money had committed a crime or were unhappily married and decided to experience this great adventure under the leadership of Kaiser Maximilian of Mexico. It is interesting that it was actually the first time in Slovenian history that so many young people voluntarily joined a military formation. They used to go to war like under Napoleon or in the fight against the Turks. But back then, they didn't go as volunteers, as they were forced. It is unfortunate that we don't have a single monument in Ljubljana to commemorate this expedition. We only have a building called Mexico. It's a residential complex near the clinic center. And we have our comics, which will outlive their authors, and the next hundred years too. The volunteers were trained in barracks in Ljubljana, which were located directly on the Ljubljanica River, from which the Slovenian capital gets its name. After standing empty for a long time and being divided into two parts by the construction of a road, the building is now hoping to provide a home for Slovenian contemporary art. Before Maximilian took over from the French Emperor Napoleon III as the ruler of Mexico, the passionate sailor commanded and reorganized the Imperial Royal Navy. After the lost Battle of Solferino, he and his wife moved to the Miramare Castle near Trieste, which was built for them specially on a part of the Adriatic coast now belonging to Italy. But today's coastal region of Slovenia also attracted prominent guests to the sea more and more throughout the 19th century. The formerly insignificant fishing harbour of Porto Roche, a district of Peran, was transformed into a fashionable seaside resort at the end of the 1800s. In 1908, the Viennese architect Johann Ostakio took over the planning of the Palace Hotel, which was officially opened in 1910 as one of the largest and most magnificent hotels on the Upper Adriatic in the presence of the heir to the throne, Franz Ferdinand. Franz Ferdinand is also said to have visited the hotel on the Adriatic coast with his family shortly before his assassination in 1914. After 1945, numerous film stars stayed in the impressive hotel building, including Sofia Loren, Lex Barker, Adriano Celentano, and Marcello Mastroianni. While the charm of the Danube monarchy can still be felt in Porto Roche, the long and close connection between the two harbour towns and Venice is felt everywhere in Copa and Peran. The Italian composer Giuseppe Tartini was also born in Peran, and his monument stands in his namesake main square. 
The square was redesigned by architect Boris Podreka in 1992 to mark the 300th anniversary of the composer's birth. The white stone ellipse is a reminder of the electric tram that ran here until 1953. Piran and Copa were Venetian until 1809, and then became part of Napoleon's Illyrian province and, after the Congress of Vienna, part of the Habsburg monarchy until the end of the First World War. After the First World War, the region became part of Italy, and the Slovenian language was banned in public. Even after the Second World War, the fate of the Slovenian Adriatic coast as part of the free territory of Trieste remained unresolved for a long time. Ultimately, Copper and Peran were only awarded to Yugoslavia in 1954. Although the Slovenian Adriatic coast always played an economic role in the region, its strategic importance remained low compared to Trieste. The Slovenian Alpine crossing, on the other hand, was more strategically important. It gained tragic notoriety during the First World War. Even today, fortresses such as Fort Cluser bear witness to the horrors at the Isonza Front, which was named after the Italian name of the river Socha. The aim of the Italian troops was to advance across the Dolomites towards Trieste and the Ljubljana Basin. After 11 Italian offences, with 100,000 casualties, the Italians were only able to take the town of Gorizia. In the 12th battle, the Central Powers were victorious and advanced as far as the Piave River, along which the front line ran until the end of the war. However, the region around Clusa was already hotly contested before the First World War. In 1809, Napoleonic troops invaded Austria via the Predel Pass, where a battle took place at the Hermann Fortress. This was subsequently named after Captain Johann Hermann von Hermannsdorf, who died in battle and is commemorated today by a monument. Napoleon pursued three goals in the conquest of the Slovenian coastal regions. Firstly, it was to protect Italy from an invasion from the northeast. Secondly, to establish a land connection with Turkey, because Napoleon had an ambitious plan to penetrate the Orient which, in my opinion, was unfeasible. And thirdly, Austria had to be separated from the sea. During the Napoleonic period, Slovenian self-confidence was strengthened in the Illyrian provinces, even though this was not one of Napoleon's aims. Napoleon had no Slovenians, Croatians, Illyrians, or Yugoslavians in mind. By occupying this territory, Napoleon realized his geostrategic and military goals. The person who changed and improved the situation was his governor general in the Illyrian provinces. Marshal Marmont, by introducing the Slovenian language into primary and secondary education. It was a measure that attempted to give public validity to the Slovenian language. He demanded that a Slovenian intellectual, specifically Valentin Vodnik, write practically all textbooks in Slovenian for primary and secondary education. Napoleon brought an end, at least for a few years, to the dominance of the Habsburgs, which had begun with the defeat of Ottokar II Przemysl in Dunkrut in 1278, who united areas of present-day Slovenia with the territories of Austria for the first time. He gained power not only in Austria and Styria, but also in the regions of Carniola and Carinthia. And when he also became governor of Friuli, his power extended from the Sudetenland to the Adriatic Sea, although his success was short-lived. He got too much power and an insatiable hunger for power and was therefore not considered a candidate for election as Roman Emperor in 1273. 
And Rudolf von Habsburg was elected. And Rudolf von Habsburg was, we call it insignificant today, an insignificant and harmless candidate. At that time, the Duchy of Austria was far from being identical with the territory of today's nation-state, and today's Slovenian territory was divided into several countries. Slovenia consisted of the lands of Carniola, part of Styria and Carinthia, which were part of the empire. The western part of the Slovenian territory had belonged to the Venetian Republic since the late Middle Ages. The eastern part of Slovenia, today's so-called Prekmuria, belonged to the Hungarian Empire. The Habsburg Rudolf IV immortalized himself in Slovenia by founding a town. In 1365, the year he had the university built in Vienna, he laid the foundation stone for Novo Mesto, also known as Neustadl or Rudolfsviert. The Austrian duke thus created an important trading base between the Hungarian territories and the Adriatic. Another Habsburg foundation in Slovenia is better known than Novo Mesto, the Lipica stud farm, from which the famous horses of the Spanish riding school in Vienna originally came. Archduke Charles founded the stud farm in 1580, although the white horses were still multicolored at the beginning of breeding. Even though the Lipitzan horses had to be evacuated several times due to the war, the old administration and stable buildings have been preserved to this day. The meadows where the horses grazed during the day have been reclaimed from nature over the centuries, as the stones of the karstic landscape had to be removed first. As important as the Lipitzan horses were for the Habsburg monarchy, in Slovenia it was not so much the Habsburgs themselves who shaped the country for centuries, but various noble families who administered and farmed the land. One of these families were the Oesbergs. The Oesbergs were mostly based in Carniola from the Middle Ages. And the Oesbergs in particular were very important because they had an exposed position meaning they were really at the tip. They were located close to the southeastern border of the Austrian Empire and later played a major role in the Ottoman defense. In order to protect themselves from Ottoman attacks, numerous fortified churches were built. One of the best known and most striking of these fortified churches is located in Hrastovlje, a few kilometers east of Kopa. This Romanesque Church of the Holy Trinity, situated in an agricultural landscape, is completely decorated with fresco paintings. These include a dance of death from the end of the 15th century. The Basilica of Mary the Protectress with the mantle in Ptuiska Gura, not far from Ptui, is a church that can be seen from afar and was converted into a fortified stronghold during the Ottoman Empire. This popular pilgrimage church also has well-preserved Gothic frescoes depicting scenes from the life of Jesus in the former chapel of the Holy Cross. Ktui Castle can be seen from the pilgrimage church. There you can not only find medieval armor and an impressive interior from the Herberstein family estate, but also a banqueting hall with paintings from the 17th century depicting Ottoman warriors and other oriental motifs.
People fled the conflicts with the Ottomans from the Serbian Orthodox regions in the Balkans and settled in what is now Slovenia. Muslims only settled in today's Slovenia in the 20th century during the time of the Yugoslavian state. Today, around 4% of the population profess Islam. In recent years, an architecturally impressive mosque has been built for them in Ljubljana. Approved by the city council without a dissenting vote, its construction was seen by politicians as a sign that cultural diversity is respected in Slovenia today. In addition to the Oyersbergs, their relatives, the Ortenbergs, were also of great importance for the development of the Slovenian territories. They contributed significantly to the colonization of the wooded karst regions in the south of the country. You can get an idea of the colonization of the region by the Ortenbergs in a small bilingual museum in Kochivia. Only a few buildings around Kochivia are reminiscent of the Gotchir period. An example is the small Corpus Christi church on the outskirts of the town, which was renovated a few years ago together with the descendants of the Gotchirs. If you drive through the gently undulating landscape, you will also see individual farmsteads, some of which are the last remnants of Gotcha settlements, to which multilingual information boards refer today. Numerous castles have been preserved in Slovenia as visible signs of medieval history and still characterize the Slovenian landscape today. The Predjama Cave Castle is probably the most famous and most visited castle in Slovenia because of its impressive location. At the end of the 15th century, it was owned by Erasmus von Lueck, who was in the service of the Habsburgs and went down in history as the Slovenian Robin Hood. After his cave fortress managed to avoid being conquered by military means, Lueck was reportedly defeated by betrayal. Servants gave a signal with a candle when the knight was sitting on the toilet. The cannons were pointed at the toilet, and that was his end. While the castles were initially used for protection, over the centuries they became the representative seat of the noble houses active in Slovenia. In the 19th century, Ptui Castle became one of the administrative centers of the Herberstein family in Slovenia. Before the Herbensteins, the Styrian Adams family owned Ptui Castle. This was of great importance for the development of the town and the region. Not far from Ptui, the Adams had Stattenberg Castle built in the 18th century. Today, the castle is home to a museum, with only the banqueting hall and parts of the Baroque bedroom furnishings remaining as reminders of the Adams time. Like the Austrian imperial family, the traces of the noble families living in Slovenia have also disappeared. These were regarded as German, even though some of them had lived in what is now Slovenia for centuries. The problem of the nobility in our country lies in the fact that the origin of the nobility was labelled as foreign or German in traditional Slovenian humanities. This is partly true, but partly not, because part of the nobility also consisted of senior civil servants, successful merchants, and intellectuals who were ennobled by the Kaiser according to the rules that applied in old Austria. So it is by no means true that all the nobles in Slovenia were only Germans. I think we should link these people with the identity of the provinces of the time, which was still very strong in the 19th century.
The Silis family occupies a special position among the noble houses in Slovenia. Not only is Celje, an important Slovenian town in the heart of the country, named after them, but the three stars of their coat of arms can also be found in the Slovenian flag today. The Silis were initially an important ally of the Habsburgs. Over time, however, they developed into a serious competitor with strong allies such as Sigismund of Luxembourg and the Hungarian king, who supported the Silies in their endeavors to create an independent dominion. The countries of Selye and Ortenburg then actually became a separate principality. This led to the final break with the Habsburgs. War broke out between the Counts of Selye and the Habsburgs, which was settled in 1443. The settlement took the form of an inheritance contract, but this soon sealed the end of the Silies after Ulrich of Selye was murdered by his own relatives in Belgrade in 1456 and left no descendants, meaning the Habsburgs were finally able to establish themselves in Slovenia. Today, you can immerse yourself in the exciting history of the Silies in the newly remodeled Celia Museum. However, the museum takes you even deeper into the history of the town, as the excavation of an old Roman road and several Roman houses can be found in the basement. In addition to the three stars of Sinis, Slovenian's highest mountain, Triglav, also features on the Slovenian coat of arms. Its first ascent is closely linked to the Slovenian entrepreneur, scholar, writer and patron Žiga Zois. At his manor house in Ljubljana, he hosted a roundtable of renowned Slovenian intellectuals of the time, including the naturalist Balthazar Aki. Inspired by this group, he decided to make the first ascent of Triglav in 1777. Although it was not him but his companion Lorenz Vilomitsa who was the first person to reach the summit of what is now Slovenia's highest mountain in 1788. Subsequently, there was a dispute between German and Slovenian alpine climbers around Triglav. It started with the German and Austrian Alpine Club, who put all the signs and directions up in the Triglav in German, although the people in the area were all Slovenians. In response to this appropriation of Triglav by German mountaineers, the Slovenian members left and founded their own Alpine Association, and the priest and composer Jacob Alias acquired the summit in 1895 and erected a small tower on it, which not only gave mountaineers protection, but also provided orientation in the Julian Alps with the help of a map of the surrounding mountain peaks. He thus laid claim to Slovenian ownership of Triglav, and with the song Oi Triglav Mui Dom, he also created a musical monument to the country's highest mountain. I would say that it looks over the mountains from right in the middle of the Julian Alps. For me, it is a mountain with no borders. The significance of Triglav is also reflected in contemporary art, which repeatedly questions the identity-forming character of the mountain. Especially important is a work by the performance collective OHO, which reenacted the Slovenian national symbol in Ljubljana in 1968. The piece was recreated in 2004 by the artist collective Erwin, and in 2007 directly on Triglav by three young artists who all rename themselves after the Slovenian politician Janis Janša. Even more important than Triglav for the self-image of the Slovenian state is the Slovenian language, and thus also the renunciation of the German language, which many Slovenians associate with cultural imperialism. The artists' collective New Slovenian Art, NSK, dealt with this topic. 
In connection with the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, Slovenian culture had been dominated by the German language for more than a thousand years, and this also provided the starting point for the art collective of new Slovenian art, NSK. In the works of the NSK, however, this is not done by means of irony or direct criticism. On the contrary, it is about over-identification, as the Slovenian philosopher Slavoj Žižek called it. In other words, a principle in which the artist identifies with that which he would otherwise criticize. A founding member of the NSK is the band Leibach, which formed in 1980. By using totalitarian symbolism, they not only took a critical look at the communist regime of the time, but also at the phenomenon of mass culture in general. It deliberately used the German language, and it wasn't just former Yugoslav partisans in the 1980s who were provoked. The dominance of the Slovenian language today could make you forget that the country has actually been multilingual for centuries. In addition to the Slovenian-speaking population, the German-speaking population also made up a significant proportion, particularly in Carniola and southern Styria. In addition to the Slovenian-speaking population, there was also an older Autochonus group on the coast, the descendants of the Latin-Italian Romance-speaking population. This area was therefore clearly multilingual. The influences on Slovenian music, which accordionist and composer Bratko Bibic also used in his art, were equally diverse. On the one hand, the music came from the western Slovenian-Italian border, across the Soca. On the other hand, there is the music of Prekmura with the Hungarian influences, as well as the Istrian music, which mixes Dinaric South Slavic folk music. From the point of view of folk music, it should be said that Slovenia is in one way or another a borderland, but also a border society. That is why the differences within the different music combine with those of its neighbours. The focus on Slovenian and the conscious use of the Slovenian language was first imposed in the 19th century and went hand in hand with the nationalist movements that were emerging throughout Europe. At the same time, however, close ties remained with Austria, which was also evident in the economic ties between the two countries. Many Slovenian companies were founded by, or together with Austrian investors, and many of today's renowned Slovenian health resorts owe their development and economic upswing to the shared history of the two countries. The Grand Hotel in Rogashka Slatina still exudes the charm of the imperial era. The hotel's magnificent ballroom features a fresco mural of the emperor, although he never visited the hotel himself. In the hotel's equally ornate concert hall, you can see busts of numerous famous composers, including Franz Liszt. Liszt entertained guests as a pianist at evening concerts, which are still held in the concert hall or in the hotel park today. The influence of the monarchy can still be felt in the country's cities, especially in the capital, Ljubljana. However, this is primarily characterized by the architect Jose Plesnik, who gave the country a new architectural phase after it was hit by a severe earthquake in 1895. Plesnik's house is now home to a museum that is well worth a visit. The Slovenian art historian and multi-award winning author Robert Szymoneszik also studied his life and work intensively when he was working on his art historical monograph on the Slovenian secession.
Plečnik je za Slovence pomemben kot seveda simbol. Plečnik is of great importance to Slovenians as a symbol of Slovenian architecture, modern architecture and also in international terms. He was already an important personality during his studies with Otto Wagner in Vienna, not only as an architect, but also as a thinker and an exceptionally introverted personality who looked to the past and the future at the same time. Plesnik, born and educated in the monarchy, was an outstanding, albeit not untypical, Slovenian intellectual around the year 1900. On the one hand, Slovenian visual artists such as the internationally most famous Plecnik were born within the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. On the other hand, they were extremely nationally orientated. Slovenian artists of the time, such as Richard Jakopic, Matej Sternin, Mateja Jama and Ivan Groha, on the one hand, an artist such as Maxine Gaspari or Sasha Santel on the other, who mainly internalized the Viennese secession, were aware of the importance of the Slovenian people and Slovenian identity. This is why the motto of the visual artist living in Vienna was from the people to the people. The center of artistic and cultural development around 1900 was the then provincial Ljubljana, which at that time had neither museums nor a university. It was here that artists were drawn, and it was here that a fusion of different ideas and artistic styles took place, from impressionism to symbolism and to secession. Joža Plešnik is probably a good example of Slovenians' emancipation from the Austrian monarchy. He adopted cultural trends from the imperial city and developed them further, creating his own unmistakable style. A strong national self-confidence and after 1945, the communist government ensured that many traces of the shared history with Austria disappeared. Nevertheless, numerous architectural monuments still bear witness to Slovenia's close ties with the royal capital of Vienna and the Austrian imperial family. And as in 2020, with the Year of Neighbourhood Dialogue initiative, the two countries, who are now equal members of the European Union, are repeatedly creating signs that document this long bond and shared history, but also question it critically. In the Vienna Culture House, the exhibition When Gesture Becomes Event features 16 works from young Slovenian and Austrian artists. The president of the Houses Association, Tanja Prusnik, was pleased about this initiative of the two states, not least after the Corinthian Slovenia had been long operating across borders. For me, this is not an unusual way of working, but it is actually just a consolidation of my own self-understanding. Because for me, I live my life speaking three languages, German, Slovenian and art, as the third language, of course. And there is the chance to do this in Vienna, to make the language visible again, in this melting pot of culture. Whilst the Slovenian contemporary art hardly deals with Austria or the German language anymore, the many modern artists from Carinthia, Slovenia and the Slovenian language are an important topic. This applies to Tanja Brusnik too, who also finds inspiration for artistic creations in Slovenia. My areas of activity are actually spread throughout Slovenia. I'm actually very much at home in the Slovenian Mediterranean. I also work there a lot. I have just completed a work this year as part of the Corinthian plebiscite anniversary. Piran have displayed it, and there is a big project planned for the next two years. They will even need across the Slovenian border, across the sea, to the Croatian border.
The dreams of the South are reflected in Slovenia not only in the magnificent architecture from the Austrian imperial era, but they are also experienced today in the relationship of many Austrians with their southern neighbor. The diverse and rich cultural landscape of Slovenia, which lies further from the Adriatic coast, is being increasingly noticed and appreciated. Where despite the border that has existed since 1918, the long shared history of the two states is still palpable throughout.